Over the last couple episodes of Budgeting Ammo, we've been talking to you guys about everything from the basic idea behind Budgeting Ammo, to the different weapons that you might be training with, to the reasons why you might want to train in the first place. And I know we've gotten some pushback from people saying, well, ammo prices are going back to normal. And the reality is, ammo is always going to be volatile. All it takes is some sort of an event or political pressure for the prices to continue to skyrocket. So our team thinks that it's super important for you to be investing in a solid plan, whether the ammo prices are high or low. And in fact, if this is leading into a low time for ammo prices, it's the perfect time to get a solid training plan in place. So today we're gonna to be continuing that series of budgeting ammo. And we're gonna be talking to my friend Phil from Bigger Training about how we can create a realistic training plan that's actually investing your money wisely in your ammo, and it's gonna help you get the skills that you need to be a better defender. Let's dive into it. Guys, today on the range, we're gonna be talking all about creating a realistic training plan. And this is another episode in our series of budgeting ammo. And I'm hoping that you guys really enjoy this because there's some pretty good information that I think you're gonna get out of this video. We're on the range today with my friend, Phil of Vigure Training. And Phil has a pretty cool background. He also has a lot of experience training people and has kind of a unique and different in some aspects training concept that I think you guys are gonna enjoy. So it's good to have you, man. Yeah, it's great to be here. I'm, I'm excited. So uh, a little bit about my background, right? We were talking yeah. about that in my intro. Started off in the Marine Corps. Uh, back in the 90s, not a lot going on there. Uh, yeah, I know I'm old, getting there, getting real <laughs> old, but uh, was in an anti-terrorism unit. I uh, ended up in a line infantry unit, but what I really found out while I was in the Corps was that I enjoyed teaching. Yeah. So I started off as a CQB instructor, became a water survival instructor. My joke to everybody I trained there is, man, if you got to take down a ship and you get kicked in the drink, I got you covered both sides. So, nice. Uh, I found out I, I really dug instructing and teaching. Uh, so I took that out of the Marine Corps, jumped right into law enforcement and worked in patrol. Uh, did my first stint full-time in law enforcement for 14 years and jumped out and went into the private training sector, which I was also working in at the same time. So over the last 21 years between law enforcement and private training sector, build up a diversity of different types of training, everything from teaching a brand new handgun owner, this is a gun, this is the end the bullets come out of, up through military contract work, getting folks getting ready to go overseas in support of the GWAT. Uh, and everything in between. So civilians, law enforcement, military, intelligence assets, contractors. Uh, I've been fortunate to have some diversity in my training career and, and working in that and a lot of different assignments, a lot of different experiences, uh, a lot of real cool men and women that I've met over the years. So yeah, man, that's, that's my elevator speech. That's yeah. as short wind as I can make it. Well, and that's awesome. And I think that it's important to touch on that stuff. And the reality guys, is we have a desire at TA Targets to provide you guys information. There's gonna be a time where you know, I can get people on the range and show you how to basically handle a pistol or something, show you basically how to handle a rifle. Then there's topics that are gonna be hypothetical for me. I'm not gonna have the data from my personal experience to say this is how you do this thing and why. And that's where what excites me about what we're doing with TA Targets is tapping into guys like you so yeah. that you can give a lens that's gonna be valuable to people. Yeah, man, I'll give you words for it. Here's how I say it. I'm going to give you my thimble. So any one of us, anybody, doesn't matter who you are, we've all just got a little thimble of experience, yeah. right? And it fills up that small amount, but collectively together, we all drop it into the bucket. And then my job as an instructor, my job as a mentor, coach, teacher, is to take that bucket and straight up pre-COVID, 1950s style football practice, dip a ladle into that and give everybody a drink of the collective yeah. bucket of knowledge, if you will. So that's a real cool way to, to share it and work with individual experiences to, to get everybody better, to really make everybody better and yep. give everybody a way to become better themselves. Yeah, and so one of the big questions that people have, and it's something that we've been preaching a lot, and it's my belief. So my belief, and I wanna get your opinion on this, my belief is having, so we all have the right to carry firearms, own firearms, all that stuff. And with that comes a, a very important responsibility of going out and seeking training. I feel like if we can tap into that culture we have a better community. And I, I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, responsible ownership, education and understanding, like it's a right, it's our right. There's no right. no permission slip needed, there shouldn't be. And, and we don't need that permission slip to do it, but we can also do the responsible thing and, and also be better for our families. I mean, ultimately that's what we're talking about, protecting our own lives to protect the ones we love. Yep. And, and there's no reason not to be, to be good at that. Will you ever need this? I mean, the chance is statistically no. 
Right. But if you do, you really, really need it. And you want to have those skills, just that confidence and empowerment of having some knowledge and getting better with, with all aspects of your personal safety. And that's something that, although it's not really the point of this video, it's something that we've gotten some pushback on our YouTube videos. I know there's trolls and they just, they troll to be trolls, but there's a lot of people that think that we carry firearms out of fear. And I tell people this all the time. There's, I'm not scared, but I recognize that something's inside of my being that says, if I can do something to help people, even if it's myself, yeah. you know, there is an aspect, it's okay to be selfish when it comes to self-preservation. You want to protect yourself because you probably have people relying on you. I feel like it's my duty, especially because I own firearms, to take it seriously to a level that is more than just going out and plinking. And I'm not against people going out sure. and shooting cans. And That's fun. It's American. I mean, I, I think that if you want to get together in your backyard and, and hang out and shoot cans off a post, by all means. But if you say, I carry this pistol to defend myself, and the reality is you went to Cabela's and you bought it at the counter and you went home and you stuck it in your gun safe and you have no rounds downrange, you haven't seen where the failure points are, you don't know what your skill set is, I'm not gonna call everybody that's like that this guaranteed liability, but the reality is, is that enough for us to go and be able to protect ourselves? I think there's always the outliers where someone buys a gun and they have it at just the right time, just the right moment, and they're able to defend themselves. But the reality is, I don't think we can train enough. Yeah. And today, what I wanna to talk to you about is how can we give our followers, the people that watch us and everybody, anybody who might come across this video, some tips on how to create a realistic training plan. Yeah. And that's kind of what I want your input on. Yeah, awesome. So what the way I look at it, this isn't just for firearms training. This isn't even just for training. This is the discussion. This is the human condition of quantity versus quality. Yeah. And how those two interact with one another. And if we start off with the general understanding that nobody gets enough quantity, nobody. And yeah. I mean, I've trained, I train new gun owners who just bought a pistol. They go through a four hour basic class and, and they say to me, man, I just don't feel like I have enough time to train. And then through the diversity of my, my training career, I was fortunate enough to, to train with some, some pretty special people that are at the highest tier uh, of, of the American military system. And a class that I, I trained specifically with those folks uh, was a concealed carry class. So this was us teaching uh, Naval Special Warfare assets, concealed carry. They were looking at low vis operations. And the first time that I watched those guys shoot a pistol, I thought, you know, I, I thought they'd be better. Yeah. They were very good, don't get me wrong. Very good shooters, proficient, safe. Yeah. Uh, but they were not, you know, they were they were high B class USPSA shooters. Yeah. Maybe low A class. They weren't grandmasters. And uh, a really senior chief uh, spoke to me about it, had a great words for me. He said, hey man, we don't have time to train. Yeah. It's a secondary system. I have to be world class at 100 things. So the reasons are varied but we don't have the quantity. We start with the understanding and the realization and just the admission. We can stand here and say, well, I, I gotta train more. I gotta go to the range more. I can even put a plan in place and think I'm gonna go three, four, five, six times a week, but then things like the ammo crunch happen. Yep. And it becomes a resource of not only time, but a resource of actual material and cost. So we can either start from that position, fight it, or, or just accept it and say, man, we're not gonna have enough quantity to really feel good. So in that case, quality has to jump up. Yep. So the way that I push my quality, the way that I think it's important for someone looking to build a training program is to focus on that quality and focus on what's important. Ignore the flash and really boil down an essence of what, what do I need to be good at? Yep. What core skills? And when I, when I put this together, I apply this to something I call the 80-20 principle. Yep. There's a whole bunch of different 80-20 principles out there. This is mine. And what 80-20 states is that 80% of my time, 80% of my resources are gonna to go to my core fundamental skills. What do I need to know how to do, in this case, to run a handgun for protection, for self-defense? Yep. What are my core skills? I keep those simple, and I design my drills around those core skills and let everything else happen, the other 20%. So everything you can think of that you need to know how to do with a gun. I say, take a list, go on a whiteboard, and I used to do this when I was a young trainer. I thought I had to, to hit everything in every single episode and always go at every session, I was gonna train everything possible. It's just not, it's not realistic. Yeah. So if you take that list and you figure out what's the core, what's important, and then everything else can happen organically. So for me, my three fundamentals, my three cores and my 80% are getting the gun in the fight, making the first hit, because hits count. Yeah. But the urgency to that hit really, really counts in a fight. Very rarely do you see fights where everything's slow, it takes its time, it develops. Um, the most common thing you're gonna see is encounters, the pace at which they develop, the pace at which they happen, occur, and finish 
shocks people how fast it is. It's quick, yep. it's seconds. So urgency matters. So time to that first hit. Get him a gun in the fight, getting a hit. For a handgun, it's keeping that gun on target shot to shot to make multiple hits. The ballistic capabilities of a handgun is limited. It's only gonna do so much, it's not a rifle. Okay, so I know that I may need to shoot multiple times to stop that threat or to keep that threat off of me. Okay, so get my first hit, get multiple hits. Getting multiple hits is just a product of my fundamentals of marksmanship. How I grip the gun, how I run the trigger, how I interact with my sights, all right? That's yeah. what that is. And then my third fundamental that I focus on is realistic movement principles. Not cool range, you know, no combat glide. I'm not worrying about growl showing. I'm not worrying about doing something that I think looks good or that I think theoretically is gonna happen in a fight. But how do we really move? What are the patterns of movement that I see in a real fight when someone's encountered with a deadly force situation? And then how do I train that? Yeah. I take those three things and I build my drills around those three pillars. And everything that else that happens, reloads, my function clearance, one hand manipulations, everything else I need to know how to do, all the specialty stuff that, that looks cool and is, is flashy and is enjoyable, and we need to know how to do it. You gotta know how to do a 20% skill. But I pick that up organically yeah. and I focus on my core. One of the things that you touched on, which I think is really unique, I think of all the people that I've shot with, you're probably one of the more analytical as far as diving into footage of things that happen, seeing real use of force in the real world. And I wanted you to touch on that a little bit because I see people saying things, for a good example, your multiple hits with a handgun. I see a lot of people assuming whether it's a handgun or a rifle that, okay, I draw, I get the first round on target, that guy's gonna stop. Yeah. He's just going to stop, which does, I mean, it does happen. It does. But the reality is you analyze realistic things. Can you kind of talk about that yeah, yeah, a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So this is something that's been fairly recent for me over the last couple of years, and there are guys that do it better than I do it as far as scientific research study. You know, I, I gave my background, I'm a Marine, I was, I'm a cop. I, I don't come from the high halls of academia and, and scientific, but I would watch this and as we see more and more fights happen, as, as society gains more cameras, right. and there's a, there's a body camera on, on a lot of your cops, there's a high def video camera in everyone's hands all across the world, and sites like World Star and everything else are huge because yep. of that phenomenon. Everybody videos everything. Ring doorbell cams, surveillance cameras. I mean, we're a camera world now. We see more and we're able to analyze. So I always had these kind of instincts about what was happening, but I wanted to take some time and really dive into it and start looking at specifics. So one of the things I did was I did a movement study, specifically geared towards law enforcement because body cam footage is the most readily available. But if you take it and you look at it against civilian encounters and, and non-military, non-law enforcement encounters, the movement patterns are often very similar. So I did a, a white paper study where I reviewed 700 law enforcement gunfights to determine how do we actually move in fights and then how can we better train that. And within that study, I also picked up a ton of information I didn't know. The old classic, you find what you don't know you're looking for. Right. And this was one of those studies where I did that. And things like multiple hits you brought up, and it's a great point and a, an example there. Multiple hits are one of those things that happen naturally. One, because the pistol ballistics aren't great, but also because of the fact that if you enter in human behavior patterns and, and the human aspect of this, our body, under that perceived threat, our body's pressing that trigger quickly, and it doesn't have the capability or it doesn't easily have the capability to just fire one shot and take a look, oh, did I, did I get my results? And then wait and fire another. Once that threat's there, um, it's that reflexive, get the threat off of me and I do so with bullets. And my finger's pressing the trigger. You, know, you think about most people, even untrained, an untrained cyclic rate in a handgun in most people is between five and six rounds per second. So in one second, it takes me to do anything. I can fire six rounds. Right. So to just fire one shot, we see multiples fired anyway. Yep. If they're going to be fired, they should be useful. Um, they should be defensive in purpose. And the fact is, I mean, the most common response, particularly for us as just private citizens, the most common response to our force is removal from the situation by the bad guy. Meaning a lot of times these crimes are going to be removal of property crimes or robberies. Removal of property by force, it's a robbery. If we fight back, they stop. A lot of fights could be stopped with one shot but our brain may not shut off that one shot in time. And then there are the higher level threats uh, that we train for, things like domestic violence or interpersonal violence, road rage, if it's not a domestic partner, uh, active shooter, things like that, where the person may be more dedicated to hurting you or hurting your loved ones or hurting people in general. They may take more, but one shots are not common for a bunch of reasons, behavioral patterns and, and also the realities of, of what we're facing. So 
it's good to have that multiple shot. Just one example of looking at what actually occurs and then setting our training up to be successful in that as opposed to counter the behavioral patterns. Yeah, and that was the one thing that I was gonna ask you for your input on. At what point do you notice behavioral patterns and then we start implementing things to better the reaction? Or is it, hey, this is the natural response and we kind of have to train behind this yeah. natural law that's occurring? Yeah, I think, I think what's key is that we don't train counter to a natural reaction. And for decades we did that. We thought, well, we just gotta put more reps in the range and we'll get a stimulus and response no matter what. And if I'm highly trained, stimulus response, even if that response seems counter to our natural survival instincts, we'll just do it. And then what we find is, as we see video of these events happening, it doesn't work. We don't overwrite our body's deeply encoded survival instincts. So I think what's key is when we see a behavior pattern and we see it repeated often, we ask the question, how do I train that behavior pattern and enhance my response? Not how do I force that out? Yep. And that's, this is one of the things that I think is valuable. It's, it's a good segue as we kind of get talking to some of the drills here that can help us with training because what Phil's done in his world of training is analyze this stuff and say, hey, these are the responses and then these are drills tailored to helping you guys build skills to be better. I mean, that's ultimately what we want here. We want people to have the skill set so they can walk away, be safe, be able to protect themselves. So segueing into how can we train? We want to create a plan that's realistic. What's well, important when we talk about limited round count, limited resources, and we're lowering our rounds, and we're looking to maximize our time at the range, we're looking to maximize efficiency. Uh, we look for drills that are simple and quick to set up. And for me, when I'm out on the live fire range, I want to focus on drills that require me to press the trigger more than once. So my manipulation cycle, my draw, even reloads, even movement patterns, most of that can be trained through dry fire to the first bang. I want to focus my time, even though it takes more ammunition, I want to focus my time on multi-shot drills that are simple to set up, maximize my bang for buck. So they make me do a bunch of different things in one drill. Let me focus on a couple different things. And again, couch them at my three pillars. Get the gun in the fight, make multiple hits, incorporate realistic movement. Anytime I can do that, and add little nuances to different targeting and ways I'm going to interact with the gun up be it trigger or sights, then I'm going to get the most value out of my drill. And even though it's tempting to come out and do one shot drills to save ammo, yep. get maximum repetition, I can do the same thing in dry fire and I lose that if I don't press the trigger multiple times. So I want to focus, even in say a hundred round training session, I want to focus on drills that are going to have me firing two, three or four rounds at a time and really get the most out of each individual drill. And I think that's people's normal reaction is I don't have ammo. So I'm gonna go out and just shoot one round. Draw to one round. Yep. That's and I, the world and of I get it. I understand when you're thinking of trying to conserve a resource, you're saying limit it. But let's let's talk about that a little bit. So these three drills that you laid out, let's go through them and just briefly cover them. And as we're talking about these drills, guys, I'm gonna be asking Phil a couple questions, and we're gonna have some footage showing these drills in action. And we want you guys to leave comments in the comment section because if this is something that you see or you're, you're saying, hey, I don't really understand, we can do follow-up videos. We can dive into this deeper on specific topics. So definitely give us feedback in that area. But let's kick off that first drill. Let's yeah. just give us an example of kind of what you're thinking of. So my first drill that I, I start out with, and I'll start a lot of my training sessions with this, is my five at five standards, okay? It's 21 rounds, everything is shot at five yards. It's normally shot on a VTAC target. You can shoot it on any target that has USPSA scoring zones. You can shoot on any target you want. If you want to score it for the actual standards, you're using a paper target. You can do this on an indoor range with no capability to move. It gives you a lot of both presentation, multiple shot strings of fire, multiple targeting. It throws a reload into there. It's macro aiming, micro aiming. It's a whole lot of different things. Five yards, 21 rounds. When you know the drill, you can set it up and run it literally in 30 to 45 seconds and run the entire drill. If you pre-stage your mags, you can shoot the whole thing in about, yeah, like I said, 30 to 45 seconds and belt it out quick if you want to. The par times on it are set to be very, very challenging. So they're designed to be really, really challenging and give you a very high standard. It requires 100% hits and meeting all your par times. There's two, two levels of par times. Um, one's challenging, one of them's really pushing and smoking and, and, and that's what you want to work to. But very, very simple, five yard line, 21 rounds, off you go. So as far as the drill, what is it specifically working? Like what does the course of fire look yep. like? Give us a little rundown of that. Yeah, so it's five strings. String one is draw to one round. String two is draw to five rounds. And these are upper thoracic, so the upper half A zone. 
String three is draw three to the body, two to the head. String four is draw three rounds to the body, perform an emergency reload, two rounds to the body. And then string five is draw five to the head. What makes it challenging, that at five yards, those are simple hits. What makes it challenging is the starting par time set is two, three, four, five, six. So draw to hit in two seconds. That's slow as molasses, right? Yeah. Draw to five and three, three and two and four, three reload, two in five, and then six headshots in a two inch circle in the head. So that's your base level. Once you clear that, once you clear my patrol qualification, you move on to the SWAT qual, which is a lot trickier. That, your part times are one, two, three, four, five. So it's a yeah. sub-second draw to a sub-five-second, or sub-two-second five rounds, three, two, and three, three reload, two, and four, and five headshots in five seconds. So that's where it gets challenging. And the challenge comes in, you got to meet all part times, and you need to be 100% on your hits, 21 for 21. Yeah, just hearing you describe that, I can tell you that that's not going to be easy. No, it's a, it's a challenge. So in my classes, <laughs> I see, um, generally speaking, on-demand cold. If I run this test cold, law enforcement, usually we see about 5% pass at patrol and at SWAT. I've had a couple guys get close, but other than, than demoing it, and, and I don't nail my standards 100% of the time. There's some people that say you should never set standards, you can't do 100%. Yeah. I chose to make these more challenging than that. And, and full disclosure, I can't nail them. Cold, yeah, 60, 65%. Warmed up, I'm usually 85, 90% yeah. on my SWAT standards, but uh, this is a, a drill I'll run cold. I'll come to the range my first 21 rounds. I'll set up, in fact, I'll load a 14 round magazine. Uh, ready to rock and roll. I know I'm gonna hit my reload at the exact spot in the drill and I'll run my my five at five standards just to start my range session off. Awesome. So that drill sounds awesome. It sounds like you're working that warm up, you're getting the basic fundamental strings of fire. We're moving into the other drills. Yep. What are you looking at or what should we be telling folks to kind of move into? Yeah, so I want to move into drills and if I have targetry that allows it, it's even better. What I'll use is I'll use uh, an eight app with a hostage swinger on it to give me micro and macro aiming areas. And I go into a drill now called Steel Pirate. So it's a variation of a paper drill I have called the Pirate Drill. And this is a lower round count version of that. And in Steel Pirate, I'm looking to shoot between a small aim zone and a larger aiming zone, uh, the micro to macro to give me a couple different things. And there's a variety of ways I'll run this drill from shooting at the smaller target first to the larger target. And this is not only bringing my gun into the fight on the first hit, but then working my transitions in multiple planes. So shooting at someone who's moving, which is likely to occur. Movement is a, a pretty universal thing. The steel pirate drill really does a good job of forcing me to train and practice, get repetition in what it's like shooting at a moving threat. By changing my aiming zones and changing my level, both vertical and horizontal plane, I've got to drive the gun, I've got to press the trigger, I've got to manage all those things, make my hits, and that helps simulate some of that movement. So in a way, that does give me what I call a three pillar compliant drill. I'm getting the gun in the fight, I'm making a hit, I'm making multiple hits, and I'm incorporating realistic movement strategies. In this case, I'm simulating bad guy movement. Yeah. So the drill there is on a hostage swinger, um, I'll start off and go two rounds to the body, and then I'll hit paddle, paddle. I'll make it go left, right, right, left, one yep. shot each. And it's a timing. It's pretty slow because I have to wait for the paddle to swing around so yep. I can go slow. Then I'll start speeding up and I'll do things like going to the paddle first. So I'll go paddle, two to the body, up to the next paddle. My goal there trying to make my hit on the opposite side of the steel by the time the paddle's swinging around so I get my body shots faster. Macro aiming, larger aiming area, bigger area to shoot at, get my hits. And then I can do things like alternating where I'm working my way up, back and forth, starting off in the body, up to a paddle, down to the body, back up and down. And I'm working in both planes of motion, simulating that bad guy that's ducking from a point of cover or that's lowering their center of gravity as yep. they turn to run away from you. And I have to get the visuals of it, but it also incorporates and gives me how I'm visually interacting with the gun, how I'm interacting with my trigger all while doing those manipulation skills and never just one shot. So these are going to average four to uh, six rounds, depending on the variant that I put into it. And even in a four round draw, I can get a lot of reps. And somewhere in there, I'm going to go dry. So I'm going to get an emergency reload rep. Somewhere in there, if I'm loading dummies, like I have a hundred round set in my magazines now, I've got five dummies. I'm going to catch malfunctions in there. Yep. So I can work that as well. So I'm picking up those 20% skills organically, which is always better because I don't know when they're coming. I have no idea. Right. So that's my steel pirate. You can do this on paper. One way to do it on paper, I shoot by using a body scoring zone, and then I pick ears, because if you've ever seen, I use a lot of the VTAC targets. I don't know why, but the skeletons have ears. Why skeletons have ears? <laughs> they have ears. But I'll give the pirate his earrings. That's where the name of the drill came yeah. from. So shooting to the body and then the micro aiming areas, I'll slow down and I'll look to pierce the pirate's ears. Yeah. 
So you can do it as simple. Listen, if all I have is a pie plate at the range, I go put up a Dixie plate and take a Sharpie and draw two black circles on either side of it. I can go small aiming to large, micro to macro in one single drill um, and do that all together. I can even incorporate movement if I want to. So I can work short movement, but I'm gonna save that typically for the next drill we're gonna talk about. Yeah, and that the targets that he's talking about, you can get from us as far as steel targets. We have the ability to mount the hostage, and that was something kind of near and dear to me back when I first started shooting handguns and I started shooting that hostage, I saw the value of that. But like Phil said too, this isn't just an advertisement for us to say, hey, use just our steel. You can get away with a lot of different tools and what I would care about more than you buying our steel is getting out and getting trained because I want our communities trained really well. Yeah. But that third drill, let's dive into that. Yeah, so this is one, again, without getting complex, it's gotta be simple to set up, it's quick and easy. So in this one, I'm gonna set up multiple targets. Again, if I can use steel, great. Steel gives me the immediate feedback. Um, steel also gives me multi-sensory feedback. Instead of just the sound, it's the sound, the movement, it's calling the shot, it's reading environmentals. One of the, the primary advantages of steel is that it requires multi-sensory input to determine whether or not you've hit, which is identical to reading impacts in a realistic encounter. It's not just a, I can rely on them moving or I can rely on them grunting or groaning or screaming. It doesn't work that way, it's multi-sensory. So I can use steel targets, I can use paper targets, but in this I'm gonna want two targets set up. I'll start off just setting them about five yards apart. I'll offset and set up a centralized object to simulate cover and concealment, like a barrel stack, the old ambiguous range, blue barrels, whether yeah. I have a barricade. Oh, we have plenty of them here. Oh yeah, so I'm <laughs> gonna set one does. of those up. <laughs> And in this, I'm gonna focus on working movement, my movement now. So in the first one, I was really focusing and simulating small micro movements in my bad guy. In this case, now I'm gonna add in my movement to the drill to maintain that three pillar compliance. So I'm always hitting all three and I'm maximizing my training time. So I'm gonna work same side of the barrel and work in multiple targets. I'm gonna work cross side, simulating keeping an object between me and my threat. And just work variations where I'll start centered behind the barrel, perform small micro movements out to be able to make those hits and focus a lot from ready position, not just always drawing from a holster. Uh, I'm gonna incorporate run ups and run backs. So I'm gonna do short movements to that point of cover concealment in line with our natural tendency to get towards things that are protecting us. You know, we're just big dumb animals at the end of the day and we move towards objects and the perception of protection that right. those objects provide us. So I'm gonna do movement towards those objects. And again, work the problem from same side or cross side. I can work level change X drills. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with, with the concept of an X drill, two targets that I'm shooting multiple spots yep. in a general X pattern as I shoot. I can do that by incorporating cover, which forces my movement to different spots. And then I can even change levels, working high and low and changing my different heights. So there's a lot of movement factors I can throw into this and add ton of bang for buck. And again, these are gonna generally be two to four round drills. So even in a hundred round session, I can maximize repetition over and over, but I'm never doing the things that I can do in dry fire, that presentation to one shot. I can maximize presentation to multiple shots. So the question that I have for you then is, at what point does somebody go from, okay, I'm doing the basics to I've built a foundation and now I can do this kind of you know, more advanced shooting. I don't really like that term, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Move into these kinds of drills. So once you have a basic safe understanding of how to operate the pistol, I think then it's time to start moving into drills like this. So if I can function the gun in all manners, meaning I can safely load it, I can safely present it, reload it, clear my functions, make hits in a static bullseye type environment. Once I understand how to do all those things safely, then I can build into doing drills like this. These are very, very simple. And here's the real secret, right? So we're gonna lift the curtain and, and show the secret. The secret is it never gets more advanced than this. You just get better at this. Two things I can never be in a fight. I can never be too fast, I can never be too accurate. All right, those two things I can continue to work to get better at. Yeah, so guys, we know that this was, again, a 30,000 foot view. I plan to have Phil out for more content because I think that he's a resource that we can tap into to help you guys out. My hope out of this is that you walk away with at least a little bit of an idea. If we just kind of move the needle a little bit forward with you, or maybe you were out plinking and you didn't really have a goal or a set of objectives on your range days, I'm hoping that now at least you say, hey, I saw these drills they were running, saw the stuff that they were doing, it's got your wheels turning, and then the biggest thing that I wanna see people doing is getting out and getting trained. So guys, we appreciate you for checking this video out. Make sure to subscribe to our channel. We've got lots of new subscribers. We hit 10,000 subscribers just the other day and we just passed 11,000 subscribers. So it's a quickly growing channel. The only way that we can continue to do that is for you guys to support us and that's done in a couple ways. Check out our website, 
consider buying steel targets if it's within your budget. If it's not, we've got free paper targets on our website. You can buy cardboard targets on our website and all of that stuff. Guys, catch you in the next one.